once again, our democracy has spoken. So let me begin by congratulating all of you here in the 104th Congress and congratulating you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, Bill Clinton brought his tattered presidency before the new Republican Congress and tried to revive the promise of his election two years ago. I was determined then to tackle the tough problems too long ignored. In this effort, I am frank to say that I have made my mistakes, and I have learned again the importance of humility in all human endeavor. Tonight on Frontline, what happened to Bill Clinton? Another embarrassing defeat. First political hot potato. Was it Whitewater or the media? Outrage. Problems just keep on coming. And no win issue. Was he too liberal or but too conservative? has repeatedly bungled. deeper in a hole. Was it Hillary or was it Rush Limbaugh? One of President Clinton's worst nightmares. Could be the downfall of his administration. Huge Republican win. Or was it something else? Mr. President, during the campaign... Tonight, seven of the country's sharpest political thinkers ask, what happened? to Bill Clinton. Funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. This is Frontline. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. On the day after the Democrats' historic defeat in the November elections, President Clinton would try to explain to the nation what he thought the voters had said. Good afternoon. I think they were saying two things to me. Or maybe three. They were saying, let me say, maybe 300. <laughs> Well, I think that I have some responsibility for it. I'm, I'm the president. I'm the leader of the efforts that we have made in the last two years. And whatever, There was a sense that he himself was among those trying to understand what had happened. Well, I think the most interesting thing about the Clinton phenomenon is that people are very puzzled by him, and they're very baffled by him. Elizabeth Drew has long reported from inside Washington. In her book, On the Edge, she traces what has gone wrong and right with Clinton's presidency. How did a guy with all of that potential, he is very smart, he has real political skills, he started with a large amount of public goodwill behind him. He was expected to do all sorts of things. How did he go from there to uh, the political problems that he has been in? His predicament is linked to his promise. The larger promise, the idea, whatever hopes people pinned onto Bill Clinton is the reason for why they are disappointed in him now. As correspondent for the New York Times, Gwen Ifill covered Bill Clinton from the early lonely days of the campaign straight through to the White House. Perhaps it was unrealistic to think that any one single human being could come in, sweep, take the place by storm, and suddenly transform Washington, and more importantly, Americans' views of themselves. Two years ago, in a three-man race against George Bush and Ross Perot, Bill Clinton had cobbled together 43% of the vote, just enough to win. The winning strategy had been a straddle. He would move right on social issues like welfare and crime, but push an activist economic plan aimed at jobs and wages. Let us all join together in welcoming the next president. This Democratic president would be neither liberal nor conservative, but new. My fellow Americans, you can trust us 
to wake up every day remembering the people we saw in the bus trips, the people we saw in the town meetings, the people we touched at the rallies, the people who had never voted before, the people who hadn't voted in 20 years, the people who never voted for a Democrat, the people who had given up hope. All of them together are saying, we want our future back and I intend to help give it to you. I mean, I think what happened, it happened to me, certainly, and I'm sure it, it happened across the country to people who were sympathetic to him. You hear him give these great speeches. You see him at a town meeting on television, uh, maybe even tearing up over something he really feels strongly about. And that excites you or, or builds your hope for the guy and his presidency. And then it's disappointed. William Grider has long asked the larger questions most Washington reporters don't. His last book decried the betrayal of America's democracy. After that's happened to you two, three, four, five times, um, you develop the opposite sense, which is this, is, this is wonderful, I like what he says, but can I believe it? And that's a, obviously a very poisonous thing to happen to a politician, and I think notwithstanding the right-wing talk shows and all of the other flack that he's gotten that was some of, much of which was indeed unfair, he mostly did this to himself. The 100,000 watt blowtorch of free speech. Let me just tell you how I really feel. Bill Clinton is a liar, a faker, an imposter. This man has absolutely no convictions, no principles. No center. He could care less about the American people. Anger echoes across the country on radio call-in shows. Much of it aimed at Bill Clinton. He was yellow 25 years ago, and he is a bright shade of urine maze tonight. Lee Harvey Oswald, where are you? I don't know how else to say But at a moment when fewer and fewer voters feel binding loyalty to any political party, it is an anger that goes deeper. The heart of, of American anger and anxiety is about economics, and it's, about, and it's not about people getting rich or even people becoming poor. It's about a, sort of that broad middle class uh, sense of loss, slowly losing their place in the food chain on standard of living, wages, and also a long-term anxiety, not just for themselves, but for their children. In the last five or ten years, you've seen Americans really start to doubt that the American dream is still there. They worry that it's getting away, that other countries are stealing a march on us, that we're not what we used to be. Kevin Phillips has often predicted major changes in American party politics. His latest book chronicles the decay of the political system, beginning with Washington. As people have had all these feelings, 30 years of, of growing disenchantment, what happens? Washington grows and grows and grows, gets cockier and cockier and cockier. Every major piece of legislation is a Lawyers and Accountants Full Employment Act of 1989 or 92. And they say, hey, not only do these people fail us, but the more they fail, the fatter they get and the cockier they get. And they're both part of it. And I think that's why people are sitting out there in such disgust. And some of it's angry, mobilizing disgust. And some of it's passive, why don't I just forget about it, disgust. But it, the, both of those things are there. In 1992, the American people elected a man who had campaigned as an outsider. They expected change. What has happened to Bill Clinton since is not about draft dodging or whitewater, but the political choices he made from the beginning. He had promised to challenge the money politics of Washington, to reform how the Congress itself does business. But within days of his election, the Democratic barons would travel from Washington to Little Rock to argue their view of what was possible. The uh, congressional leaders came down fully and Gephardt and Mitchell to have dinner with the Clintons in Little Rock. And one of the points that particularly the House members made was, look, if you want to get a lot of legislation from the Congress, don't push us on the reform questions, campaign finance reform and some of the other reforms, the line item veto. And in effect, Clinton bought it. I don't want the continuation of the Cold War between the Congress and the White House. Pennsylvania Avenue will run both ways again. We're very much aware that 
the American people in the last election without regard to their voter preference. I did have some hope for him. And I, I found it difficult to believe that somebody who'd run so strongly against Washington and who knew how much he owed to the pro vote could come in and as blithely disregard these circumstances and hobnob with the power structure and have no qualms and just seem to talk as if he could say the same things and it, he didn't seem to understand that he wasn't doing them. Uh, I, I've been very surprised by what I, I sort of perceive in his person, this ability to believe himself when Americans don't believe him. You have the old hands in Washington saying, look, don't worry about a reform agenda. We're all in this together. We are a majority in the Senate, in the House, and we can deliver the votes for your program. Bob Woodward defined modern White House reporting. He spent 18 months behind the scenes in the Clinton White House. There is a simple reality that uh, campaign finance reform and any kind of meaningful reform agenda uh, goes over with uh, the odor of a case of dead skunks in the Congress. It just is not anything they want or are willing to deal with because this is how they get elected. This is the system. Now, in a way, Clinton ran against it. I think he didn't know enough about it in order to reform it. He was not a reformer in Arkansas in a more profound sense. He always played by the traditional rules. David Marinus won the Pulitzer Prize for his 1992 writing on Bill Clinton. In the two years since, he has interviewed more than 400 people, crafting a biography of the politician he calls first in his class. He, from a very early stage of his governorship, started cozying up to the business establishment in Arkansas. Occasionally he would challenge them, always in modest ways. But the difference here was that the leaders of Congress had a lot more power than any leaders in Arkansas. And he quickly deals with power centers and accommodates them. That's the way he works. The question of whether Clinton, as president, would play the role of the outsider who would force Washington to change was a question of whether he would be willing to stand alone. Here's a guy who wanted to be president since he was a young boy, who became president when he was only 46 years old, who was elected governor of Arkansas five times. And that's enormous success, and yet his life is really defined by loss and not triumph. The first loss, the most obvious, and, and the one that defines him more than anything is the loss of a father. He never had a father. His father was killed in a car accident three months before he was born. Without devolving into too much psychobabble, that really affected his whole life and political career. When he started his political career, it started with a major loss. He was the student politician at Georgetown University for most of his career there. And after three years, the, uh, his peers decided that they were sick of him. He was too closely attached to the Jesuit administration. Um, he was a little bit out of touch with the beginnings of the student rebellion at Georgetown. And he just was defeated by a scrappy working class kid who sort of was the, that generation's Newt Gingrich um, in many ways. And then from that point on, Clinton lost working for other candidates in five consecutive races, moving through uh, a Senate race in 1970 where he worked for an anti-war candidate, Joe Duffy, in Connecticut to the McGovern campaign in 72. He ran for Congress himself in 1974 and lost. So all through that, that early for, formula of years of his political career, he was losing. And in every case, he was trying to think of how he could attract enough votes to and change his message enough to, to become more attractive. And then in, he became governor in 1978, and in 1980, after only two years, he was trounced by a savings and loan executive in Arkansas who really was unknown. 
the conventional way of assessing that loss is that from that point on it made him the ultimate conciliator. That he was afraid to upset anyone, that he was always backing off. You could not tell what he really believed in, that he was trying to be all things to all people. In fact, those parts of his character were already there to varying degrees. And uh, I think there's a much deeper and stronger irony to the way he changed after that. He, he was so deeply affected by that loss that he essentially would do whatever it took never to lose again. And you have to understand the, the profound feelings of, of that to understand both how he became president and why he's in danger right now. The fear of losing would lead to what Marinus calls Clinton's permanent campaign, and a political character defined less by belief than by a will to survive. I don't think he's play acting when he seems one way to one group and another way to another. I think he's a very protean character, um, who in many ways is probably more authentic in, in that very diffuse way than his wife is, who seems so straightforward. I think when she's at one point um, saying that she doesn't want to stay home and bake cookies, and another point posing on all of the women's magazines in America, that she is play acting. Um, but Clinton is not in that same way when he appears to be different to different groups. It's played out probably from the very beginning of his administration when he made a promise during the campaign that he would allow gays to serve in the military. The conflict over gays in the military would prove to be a perfect example of Clinton's method, one which had repeated itself time and again in Arkansas. As I show in the book, it was just a fallop that resulted from, which I think he uh, paid for for at least a year and a half, having an inexperienced staff and knowing much less about how to function in Washington than he thought he did. He should have said, this is a matter of equity and discipline, not of whether you, what you think about gays. It's a, it's a military problem. It's a problem of discipline. A Pulitzer Prize-winning historian, Gary Wills has taken the measure of presidents from George Washington to Ronald Reagan. His latest book is on the nature of leadership itself. He started saying, well, I'd like to do this, uh, you Joint Chiefs of Staff. Tell me what you'll put up with, and maybe we can negotiate it. Well, you know, that was all wrong in every way. It made him look weak. It made uh, his uh, stand not one of principle, but of kind of... Uh, uh, it made it look like he was paying off his supporters who were gays and get, trying to bargain to get them as much as he could. And all. It was just bollocks stuff from the minute it was uh, introduced. This compromise is not everything I would have hoped for or everything that I have stood for. He had promised gays when he was with them, deferred to the Joint Chiefs when they appeared. In the end, he would please no one. I remember he stood up against this blue curtain, he looked pale, and he said, well, I didn't get everything I wanted, and I frankly was alarmed. And so were a number of Democrats on the Hill because they said, this man is not strong. Do you think you didn't think through these practical problems? Um, what have you learned from this experience in dealing with powerful members of the Senate and the Joint Chiefs? And how much of a problem is this for you? He should have just issued an executive order as commander in chief. Because then anybody who fought with him had to say, I'm going to disobey. And in our country, luckily, up to now, that's a fight the president can't lose. Civilian control is one thing that's very sacred to Americans. There's a constant measuring of strength. I can remember um, when Lyndon Johnson was getting the Great Society through, bill after bill after bill, he was getting them all through. And then one night in the House of Representatives, he lost a minor bill. And he said to his staff, now the whale has shed some blood and the sharks will move in. And he was right. He never had the same power after that. So there's a constant dynamic in testing. He was passive. Members of Congress, House, Senate, both said this to me. And these were people who were or, or could have been potential allies. 
But they talked about this sort of strange passivity, that he would listen, he might take notes. He wouldn't say, well, no, just a minute. I was elected, and I need to do X, Y, Z, and that's what I came here to do, and we're going to do it. And no real presidentialness or leadership. And that undermined the fact that he really did get a lot done. The controversy over gays in the military would also send a jarring signal to many voters. If you think a president doesn't basically agree with your values, you're going to subject everything he does to tremendous questioning. I think they, uh, they doubt the sincerity of his and his wife's religious commitment, for instance, which I don't for a minute, I think. Uh, you know, and I, I tend to talk a lot about that with politicians because I think it's so important. And uh, they both are very unembarrassed and uh, uh, knowledgeable and open about their religious views. Uh, pro probably the timing of the whole gay initiative had a lot to do with that. Uh, and that's one of the bad things about it, that it uh, created this doubt about his basic values. People were, were very mad in 1992 at Bush. They didn't know really what Clinton represented. They thought they did, but they mostly wanted not Bush. They got Clinton. They didn't like it very quickly. They can turn on a dime now. The half-life of belief in newly elected politicians is just dropping, dropping, dropping. One bullet in the stomach. One bullet for Big Al and one bullet for the boys. The controversy early in his presidency would rekindle doubts about Clinton's character, doubts that had dogged him throughout the campaign. You voted last month, on November the 8th, that was a big change. What made you vote the way you did? Did Bill Clinton have anything to do with it? Can he resurrect himself? Would you trust him again in 1996? Are you sick and tired of the 1960s generation? This guy has no morals and guts. He goes with the flow of the wind. Would you have more respect for him if he had his own core set of principles with which you... There's always been a level of hatred and dislike toward Clinton that is just um, beyond what, what, I would, what anyone would anticipate for someone like that. Um, from his first campaign in Arkansas, probably 30 to 35 percent of the people in, in the congressional district hated his guts. Um, for the uh, conservative preachers uh, would denounce his campaign and his campaign office from the pulpit, spread rumors about him, um, call him a homosexual or a libertine, one or the other, um, say that his campaign office was a den of marijuana smoking and, and free sex. I mean, there was a None of that was true in essence. There was a little bit of all of those things. There always has been with Clinton. Then, as now, the frenzy of dislike aimed at Clinton was, in part, a backlash against his generation and the decade that had shaped so many of them. There are so many things that are working against him historically. He's the first baby boomer. He's the first 60s generation, Vietnam generation. He's the first post-Cold War president. He's the first president with a professional wife. Uh, he's a southerner, which puts some people's hackles up. And then he adds to that his own personal problems, whatever they are. But I think any president would have a hard time governing right now. The reason for that is that we have had a rate of change in this country over the last two or three decades, uh, unparalleled. Uh, the whole status of women, of minorities, of blacks, of uh, gays, of Native Americans, changes in attitudes towards censorship, uh, so that many people feel rightly that the, the America they grew up with has been taken away from them, has disappeared, and they tend to blame the 60s. It was a very disruptive time. There were a lot of victims. Uh, so it was a double-edged time. Uh, it was very open. There was a lot of possibility of change. And it was, yet yeah, it was very bitter. Fights over Vietnam, over uh, campus riots, over inner city turmoil. The war in Vietnam was a great psychic wound and defeat for this country, which we are still 
not fully absorbed and and uh and and so when you say the 60s which of those experiences does it remind you of um almost every you can't escape that memory of the war both what a tragedy it was and not just the boys who were lost but the sort of the national honor was lost in some way and so then if you were standing against it uh people who thought that shouldn't have um, been the outcome or it's very it's a very simple straightforward reflex to to resent those people who were against the war to now be in the halls of power for reasons that i'm not totally sure of the negative parts of the 60s have lived on in the american imagination more than the positive parts of it more than the idealism uh, ironically some of the very events that sort of propelled the 60s generation also fueled the cynicism that we face now from vietnam to watergate um and i think that that the uh without stereotyping too much our generation went through a period of rebellion and then faced up to the real world and in probably starker and more dramatic terms than some other generations and always felt guilty about it <laughs> um and had less of a true sense of self than some other generations there was no one easy defining noble moment for this generation Vietnam was not World War II. Even though, you know, even though I agreed with uh, the liberating movements in almost every respect, and I thought it was, it was and is a, 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 an important contribution to the life of this country, you couldn't also escape the, the smugness and the arrogance of a lot of the young people in those 60s movements. And I think, uh, quite inadvertently, there are moments when the Clintons, by their own behavior, remind people of that. There's something about the, we invented the world for the first time, you know, in some of their rhetoric, which sort of, yeah, where did I hear that before? Oh, I remember the 60s. There's an enormous irony, which is that Clinton was never really part of the counterculture. He was never a rebel. Um, he was almost, but he wasn't. Um, that's, I think that's basically his problem. He's almost a lot of things. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States! When President Clinton first appeared before a joint session of Congress in early 1993, the rhetoric was still about change and reform. Tonight, the American people know we have to change. But they're also likely to ask me tomorrow and all of you for the weeks and months ahead whether we have the fortitude to make the changes happen in the right way. Our people will be watching and wondering, not to see whether you disagree with me on a particular issue, but just to see whether this is going to be business as usual or a real new day. I am asking the United States Congress to pass a real campaign finance reform bill this year. The members of Congress seemed only too happy to play their roles in the charade. He made a series of implicit deals with the power centers that exist in Washington. One of them is the leadership of the Democratic Party in Congress. And to just to take one issue, uh, campaign finance reform has been argued out year after year for quite a long time. Everybody knows where everybody stands. As president, he could have forced the Democratic Party particularly in the House of Representatives, to face the music and actually do real reform. Instead, he went to the Hill and said to the leaders of the House Democrats and the Senate Democrats, you guys work it out. I'll tell you what I'm for, but I'm not going to press the issue with you because you're my allies and friends and I need you on other issues and I'm not going to burn you on this issue. Now, I know that was said fairly explicitly in private. In public, of course, he still claimed to be the reformer. And once he did that, early in his first year in the presidency, the, the outcome was pretty, pretty obvious. <laughs> Democrats had no interest in reforming campaign finance because, on the whole, it worked for them. Um, 
Republicans had their own agenda, but they weren't dying to reform this money politics either. And so the issue sat there for two years, and then in a last sort of burst of action toward the end of uh, this year's congressional election session, uh, it dies. So who do you blame for that? Well, the White House says the Republicans did it. Well, fundamentally, the president didn't take that fight. He, he walked away from it. And, and I, I think he's to blame uh, for nothing happening. Early on, out of public view, he had thrown away a rare window of opportunity to do something real about campaign finance reform. And out of public view, he had also thrown away the means to do something real about jobs. Our immediate priority must be to create jobs, create jobs now. Some people say, well, we're in a recovery and we don't have to do that. Well, we all hope we're in a recovery, but we're sure not creating new jobs. And there's no recovery worth its salt that doesn't put the American people back to work. Left out of the speech were the details of a series of crucial decisions that had begun in the weeks before he was sworn in. Compromises that would subvert the promise of his campaign. He was the very first nominee from either party to look directly in the eyes of the American people and say, I know your wages have been declining for the last 15 years. I mean, it seems uh, that's been going on actually for 20 years, but this is the first time a major party nominee has the nerve, the courage to say it. He had confronted the unhinging of American prosperity and so pledged to steer spending toward investment in job training and education to create the kind of economic growth ordinary people could feel. I think from that moment, people could say, do I believe him? Is he serious or... Gee, I hope he's serious. And, and, uh, and that's what fueled his, his election, I think. And in a sense, set up his great fall. To invest in growth before taking on the deficit would challenge the conventional orthodoxy that deficit reduction must preempt every other economic priority. In the months ahead, behind the scenes in the White House, that argument would split his advisors in two. One of the polarities in the Clinton White House and the Clinton administration are these people who elected him, uh, the Carvels and the Begalas, the pollster Stan Greenberg, the media advisor Mandy Grunwald, who are saying, do these things for the middle class, like health care, uh, reduce taxes, and so forth. Uh, the Old Washington hands, Lloyd Benson, the Treasury Secretary, uh, Leon Panetta as budget director or in his role as chief of staff, they are saying, look, fix the deficit. That's the real problem we have. One of his political advisors, who I, I'll not name, but uh, who was a strong advocate, uh, both in the campaign and afterwards in the White House, for a, a real bread and butter economic program that would deliver real tangible benefits to working people said to me uh, months later our side was routed routed it's over we lost surrounded by warring advisors and conflicting advice he would postpone his campaign pledge to invest in training and jobs and side with the financial markets who wanted the deficit reduced Alan Greenspan, the Federal Reserve Chairman, went to Clinton and, and said, if you don't do this, you risk uh, the potential of some sort of economic catastrophe. It causes you to sit up straight and listen, take note, do the numbers, listen to alternative arguments, and uh, I'm saying if you were President of the United States, you would have done the same thing. George Bush certainly would have. Clinton really had no choice. If Bush had been elected or if uh, Bob Kerry had been elected or any of these people, they would have had the same no-choice presidency. You can argue till you're blue in the face over whether that was what he had, he, the right thing for the country or not. The fact is it's not what he campaigned on. It's not what elected him president. The whole Clinton-Gore campaign was putting people first. Well, he put the deficit first. And uh, economists care about that. Business people care about that. People who look at it care about it. But 
the average person on the street just can't feel it and can't see it. And so Clinton stopped the, uh, if you will, uh, economic cataclysm from coming, but no one is going to say, hey, yay, yay, that's, that's great, Bill. You kept us from having something that would have been awful. I don't think he liked doing it. Um, at least he would often complain to his staff that he was doing it. But he was, he can be swayed. And maybe there's another paradox there. I, I think that he was swayed by people that knew things that he didn't know, who were older, who were more business oriented. Um, they too sort of were father figures to him. And he was more familiar with the arguments and the people on the other side of that debate. Um, and more easily swayed by the ones that he thinks know things that he doesn't know. Um, and so I think it was an interesting intellectual decision on his part more than a, one from his heart. The most sympathetic way I can put it is that I think he's a very skillful politician who has, who is used to being in the middle of conflicting pressures. And he tells himself, I'll say yes to both sides and somehow down the road I'll be able to finesse the differences. Now that's the sympathetic version. My other version would be that uh, um, he's not as smart as, as he thinks he is. That he, coming from a small state in Arkansas where getting things through the legislature was often just a process of making deals with the four or five big economic interests that are powerful in a state like Arkansas. And then they'll take care of business for you. Um, I think he probably believed that coming to Washington, he could do well with that same process. When Bill Clinton put forth his economic plan, he would try to reassert his credentials as a reformer. He had a very good meeting with the president. Uh, this is one in a series He would propose to eliminate a host of government subsidies, breaks for special interests long protected by congressional privilege. And that meant doing battle with the very Democrats whose support he had supposedly bought by backing off congressional reform. It was fairly early, and a group of Western senators requested a meeting with him because they were going to raise the fees on grazing on public lands and impose fees, they're none, on taking minerals, uh, important uh, lucrative minerals from the public lands. Um, and these were among the relatively bold things that he was doing in his first budget. So these Western senators uh, requested a meeting with him and they sat down and they reminded him that uh, he was the first Democrat to ca carry some of their states. The senators involved uh, vigorously presented the uh, case for the, their constituents, for and their states. And shortly and thereafter, the administration announced it was dropping an the whole proposal. And one of the senators said to me, you know, I thought, uh-oh, he's gone too far. We didn't ask him to do that. Uh, he, they just went uh, further than had been requested. And again, that's the, the word spreads on that kind of thing, because it was in the news, but then people draw conclusions. Hey, if you go down and you push this guy, you can really get something out of him. This president has been more generous with his time in working with members of Congress than, than I could imagine. This is the third or fourth time I've been down here. And that's the president's the response to this was always, come on, let's talk about it, and then we'll all come out, we'll be happy. Uh, Lyndon Johnson's response was, what did you say your name was? He would have laid him out. And that just didn't happen with Bill Clinton. And once people figured they could have it, they could have Adam without penalty, they just got really used to it. Where are we going? Mr. President? Any reaction to the uh Well, I'm disappointed, you know. I've... At one meeting, the president had suddenly discovered that legislated caps on spending exist. And with the deals he had been making, there was no money left. He would be forced to shrink what little training, research, and investment he had been trying to protect, funds he now sarcastically called the non-Wall Street elements of his economic plan. He rages at one point in one meeting. He said, we are the Eisenhower Republicans. 
We are interested in deficit reduction, free trade in the bond market. That's the Eisenhower plan, not the Clinton plan. Well, of course, he's exactly right. As usual, his analysis is quite astute. It was now politics, not economics. And he staked his political leadership on passing a plan that had largely abandoned what he came to town to do. I think he has a political style which... Uh, is devoted mostly to demonstrating to people, first of all, how, how knowledgeable he is and how sincere he is, and, and either sincere emotionally or intellectually or both. But he, but, it, but he also pulls back from that when he does the real hardball decision-making of politics and says, can't we work this out so that most everybody is satisfied with the outcome? And that's a kind of mediating style, which in some situations is ideal, and in others, particularly the hardball of Washington politics, is often disastrous. Because those other players don't come to the table with that same motivation or, or inhibition. They want to get theirs, and if they get theirs, they don't care what happens to the whole enterprise. Bill Clinton's political life, his biographer Marinus says, has been a continuous cycle of learning and then forgetting. This is a longtime friend who said that who said that people in politics need affirmation. Now they're not all in there because of that, uh, but a lot of them are, and they need quite a bit of it. They need adulation. They need to be treated as important people. Uh, sometimes they also do good stuff, too, but it's, it's a fairly common trait. And this person was saying, but Clinton needs so much more of it than almost anybody uh, he'd ever seen. He was four years old when his mother, Virginia, married Roger Clinton. Everybody in Hope knew that Roger Clinton was an alcoholic, or at least a heavy drinker, and a philanderer. He according to Bill's mother, really loved Bill, but, but there, aren't, there isn't much evidence of how that love was expressed. He never adopted Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton took his name because he wanted to, not because his stepfather wanted him to. Um, Roger was not home much. Um, he worked at a auto dealership in the parts department and then went off partying at night. Um, when he was home, he was often yelling at Bill's mother. Um, on at least four or five occasions, he physically abused her. Bill Clinton took on the role of the family hero. There, there, there's often uh, said to be two aspects to that family hero syndrome. One is that he's the protector in the home, and the other is that he's almost absolved of responsibilities in the home to go out into the outer world and achieve and make the rest of the family proud. Um, Clinton actually served both of those purposes. He was both his mother's protector inside the home, and he was sent out to, to achieve and, and redeem the family and bring it hope. If you grow up in a household where there is conflict around you, where life around you is constantly in flux, and you, all you want to do is make it work and to hold it together, and for heaven's sakes not let it fall apart, politically that means that your job, that your instinct is never to say, go jump off a cliff. Your instinct is always to say, well, come here, let's talk about it, how can we hold this together? And that's why people look at him and say, where is your core? Where is your soul? What do you believe in? There must be something nightmarish, Gary Wills has written, for a man who wants so badly to please to find himself so thoroughly hated. He had created a National Service Corps for young people, provided tax credits for the working poor, cut the deficit so it was no longer growing faster than the economy. But he and his wife had also produced a health care plan that was too complicated and too expensive. Do you think you can turn the mood around And here? earned him the label of a big government liberal. Clinton was trying to pursue a type of liberalism that somehow or other he thought would be an extension of the Roosevelt era and then the Great Society, there would be the Clinton Society or something. And that obviously was a total mistake. 
Well, I came up with a plan that didn't work. Uh, I think they didn't uh, envision uh, the timelines that were involved in changing what is really one-seventh of our economy. I don't think they realized the political timelines. Uh, and I think there's much they didn't see. But in not seeing, they didn't deliver. The bottom line is the middle class person in this country feels screwed by the Clinton plan. Middle class person feels they didn't get what was promised. In just a couple of weeks... Why don't you take leadership? You took responsibility. You promised the middle class tax In the November elections, workers without a college degree, people making between fifteen and $30,000 a year, would abandon the Democrats. Perot voters would overwhelmingly choose Republicans who were promising a revolution in the way Washington works. Across the country, every incumbent defeated was a Democrat. They want people held accountable. So I'm saying that to that extent, that message, I got it. I accept responsibility for not delivering to whatever extent it's my fault. We haven't delivered back to the American people what they want on that. I have to accept that responsibility. I've got to go. Thank you. Mr. President. This sense of, I don't know exactly where I'm going, I don't know exactly who I am, has just out there in the public. It's palpable. You can cut it up and box it almost. And you add to that the questions about character, the feeling of distrust. Clinton has one thing left, and this is where Clinton may wind up winning in 96. He has the office. He is president. Circumstances, events may deal him a hand in which he can prove he's the leader. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. A week ago, Bill Clinton would try once again to define his presidency. This time, standing face to face with the man and the Congress who had handed his party a stunning defeat. What we have now is an interesting moment because um, Newt Gingrich has brilliantly defined a whole new agenda and said this is what the country really wants. It puts some really fundamental questions on the table. And I, and I believe it or not, find that exhilarating because I think it, it's an event that might just push um, the sort of pedestrian run of politicians to begin thinking about these questions again and have to react to them. So I, I think the... I think the loss, losses by Democrats in 1994 um, can be a really creative moment for the country. Um, and who knows where it will lead. But I think it might be the beginning of, uh, of getting back to something real in our national politics. If we agree on nothing else tonight, we must agree that the American people certainly voted for change in 1992 and in 1994. And as I look out at you, I know how some of you must have felt in 1992. <laughs> but <laughs> I, uh... The Republicans are better equipped because of being outsiders in this context to do certain congressional reforms to get that ball rolling. The thing that they will never do, and it's funny to even think about it, is do battle with the power of money in Washington and the role of the lobbies and the corporate interests and financial interests and so forth. The whole idea of the Republicans shutting this down is like New Orleans getting rid of the Mardi Gras. You know, that's not going to happen. I think we all agree that we have to change the way the government works. Let's make it smaller, less costly, and smarter. Leaner, not meaner. It was, one critic said, more smorgasbord than speech. People could hear what they wanted to hear. In the election year, when I was trying to figure out Clinton and decide what I really thought about him, I talked to one of his old, old friends who said a lot of uh, nice things about him, but, but also said, 
The question about Clinton has always been, who will he defend when the door is closed and the real arguments begin? And um, that was a little unsettling at the time, and I think it's, it's continued to be the question about Clinton. Um, and he's at that moment again now where, where we really uh, are not absolutely sure who will he defend when the door is closed. This is a very, very great country, and our best days are still to come. Thank you, and God bless you all. Going back to when he was a student at Georgetown, he could always figure out the test questions. Every, all of his buddies would, would come to him when they were studying for an exam because they knew Clinton would know which question the professor would put on the test. And in his political career, he has often anticipated the problems that he would confront. Um, but he has not figured out necessarily how to get beyond them in the long run. And that's, I guess that's the ultimate test question. And he, he hasn't got it yet. Dear Frontline, I am so grateful for Frontline. And now it's time for your letters. Our recent program, The Nicotine War, brought in a flood of letters concerned that cigarettes should be regulated. We also received a few dissenting letters. Dear Frontline, I agree that it is likely that nicotine is an addictive substance, but anyone with the intelligence to light a cigarette without burning the tip of their nose should be well aware of that possibility, as well as the other harmful results of smoking. It is thanks to your kind of alarmist, misplaced journalism that being a smoker in America in 1995 is like being a Jew in Germany in 1938. Needless to say, I don't appreciate it. Enclosed is one cigarette. I invite you to light up and lighten up, and I trust that I don't have to advise you of the risks involved. Daniel Cecil, Muncie, Indiana. Dear Frontline, Yesterday I bought a carton of cigarettes, even though I voted last November for a 20 cent per pack tax on cigarettes. Last night I saw your show on PBS. Today I'm returning the carton to the store. Tonight I will probably get up out of bed and drive to an all-night convenience store and buy a pack of cigarettes. The importance of knowing and realizing that nicotine is the strongest of addictive drugs will never be told loudly enough or publicized widely enough. Anonymous in Tucson, Arizona. Dear Frontline, the question still remains... Do we need the government to protect us from ourselves? Despite my ill will toward the tobacco manufacturers, I still believe that the individual should have the unabated freedom of choice, but I also believe in telling the truth. Morrison Giffen, Carborough, North Carolina. You can interact with Frontline by sending your comments by fax to 617-254-0243, by letter or home video to Dear Frontline, 125 Western Avenue, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. She went to Hollywood. Just start to bring your jeans down a little bit. You look like a million, Colleen. And ended up in a nightmare. You look fabulous. Colleen Applegate did not like doing sex on film. Terrific. She hated it. A small town girl. Like she just came right off the farm. No. Who killed herself. Great, take the picture. Death of a porn queen. Next time on Frontline. Then, in two weeks. Pablo Escobar, the richest, most violent criminal in history. Escobar is uh, probably the head of the largest criminal organization the world's ever known. Escobar was to cocaine what Ford was to automobiles. Next time on Frontline, the godfather of cocaine.
Funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. For video cassette information about this program, please call this toll-free number, 1-800-328-PBS-1. This is PBS.